So earlier we touched on the control board inside the servo. Let's take a closer look on how the servo control board works. Here we see a block diagram of the servo control electronics. Now I know this looks kind of complicated, but don't panic. First, the local pulse generator generates a pulse proportional in width to the current position of the shaft. The local pulse and input pulse then go to a comparator, which subtracts one from the other, generating an error pulse. That error signal goes to the stretcher, which is kind of like an amplifier. Now the reason for this is so a small difference from the comparator can generate a larger drive to the H-bridge. Now what's an H-bridge? Well, the H-bridge controls which way the motor turns, and they are used commonly in robotics to control motors of different sorts. Its drive decreases as the position of the shaft approaches the desired position. And the H-bridge and other components reside on the back of that small PCB there. You can control a servo with a simple circuit, like the one shown here, which uses a 555 timer to generate pulses. However, most of us are going to opt for a microcontroller, or a board such as the Arduino. Although you can hook some servos directly to an Arduino, beware of current troll. And I talked about this in the earlier video. Excessive current troll can ruin your Arduino. Again, I, we talked about this before, but I'm going to mention it again because it's important. Now, regardless, you may consider using separate power sources for your Arduino and servo. However, when using different power sources, make sure you connect the grounds from the sources together, or the servo won't work right. And remember, underpowered servos may behave poorly and will move slower than a properly powered servo. Finally, you can use a dedicated serial servo controller. And these act like a pulse-producing coprocessor. This frees up the Arduino for other tasks. The more common and more affordable servos are analog, which use analog circuitry to control the motor. However, digital servos use onboard microcontrollers to enhance operation and offer some advantages. Because they contain a microcontroller, you can program the actual servo to control various parameters like speed, direction of rotation, range of rotation, starting point, and more. Or you can skip the programming and use it just like an analog servo if you want. Since digital servos receive input commands faster, they can update the shaft position faster. This results in more torque and a faster response. And torque is just turning power, by the way, if you don't know what that is already. But, more torque means the motor draws more current, which can shorten battery life. On the outside, analog and digital servos look the same. And since many of us may use Arduino with servos to build things like robots, let's talk about some of the mechanical parts of the servo. It's obvious that the output shaft of a servo is its business end. Because of this, it receives a fair amount of wear and tear. The shafts on cheaper servo motors are supported by a plastic bushing. And a bushing is just a one-piece collar which supports the shaft against the casing. Better servos use metal bushings. These are usually made from lubricant impregnated brass. Of course, servos with this feature cost more, but they last longer. The best servos have ball bearings, which provide the longest life. And last but not least, to use a servo, you'll probably need to attach a horn to the spline. Horns come in many different shapes and sizes, and are often not interchangeable between different manufacturers. And here's some different servo horns with mounting hardware. Now let's talk about the gears. The continuous DC motor inside the servo spins way too fast to be useful for fine position control. Hence, the gear train is slowed down, which also increases output torque. And there are basically three types of materials used to make the gears. There's nylon, metal, and proprietary material like carbonite. Now, first of all, nylon gears are cheaper, but weaker and strip or break the easiest. They're fine for general purpose servos though, and replacement gear sets are available for many makes and models. Metal gears are much stronger, but are heavier and cost more. They're good for walking robots and large robotic arms. One caveat about metal gears, though, is that due to wear on the teeth, they can develop slop or looseness in the gear train, which can cause loss of precision. So, if you can afford it, opt for titanium gears, because they're less likely to do that. And last on our list, proprietary, like carbonite gears, are stronger than nylon but just as lightweight. While they wear a bit better than metal gears, metal is still the strongest. Let's cover some important servo specs. First, size. Servo motors follow some standards. Size is one of those. Of course, exceptions exist, but you'll often find servos in a few size categories. Now, the following dimensions are the case dimensions of the servo. 
Standard size servos are about one and a half inches by three quarters of an inch by one and three eighths of an inch and have a mounting flange with four holes. Quarter, aka large scale servos, are about twice as large as the standard ones and more powerful. Because of this, they're good for robot locomotion if you can modify them for continuous rotation. And they typically measure about two inches by one and one eighth by two and three eighths of an inch. Many in micro servos are half the size or less of the standard ones. Use these in tight spaces. A typical size for a mini servo is one and one eighth of an inch by five eighths of an inch by one inch. A typical size for a micro servo is seven eighths of an inch by three eighths of an inch by five eighths of an inch. Let's talk about some other specs. You know, they say that size isn't the only thing that matters, and it's true. Torque is another important spec, and that's often given in inch ounces at either 4.8 volts or both 4.8 volts and 6 volts. And remember, torque is just the amount of power involved in turning something. Speed or transit time is the time the motor takes to rotate through a given angle, often 60 degrees. And current consumption, unfortunately, is not always given. The amount of current the motor consumes depends on whether the servo is idling, which is like doing nothing, under a load, in transit, or stalling, which is when it stalls, it's trying really hard to turn, 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 but it can't anymore because the load is too heavy. One way to get this info is to use your multimeter to measure the current under various conditions, kind of like I did in the last video. Now note that any motor will draw the most current when stalled. So due to this fact, be careful how you power your servo. You wouldn't want to hook it directly to your Arduino and then have the robot stall. So there's more to say about servo motors and servo control. And I'm sure these topics will show up in a future tutorial. Until then, go ahead and leave a comment and tell me if you're into robotics. If so, what's your latest project like? And I'll see you next time.